All right, what's up, everybody? Is out there? Live? Well, doing as good as they can. Oh, no, don't tell me my connection is unstable. Sorry if I'm a little bit confused. I'm trying to follow a long three hour and 30 minute um, board meeting that the state has had about whether or not we can start football on time, July 27th. Good evening, Tom. And we're uh, there. Th I'm trying to follow it on Twitter and they're three hours and 27 minutes in and haven't even come to a conclusion or any decision yet. It's uh it's just crazy. Nobody will make a decision. They've got all kind of recommendations from people and medical people and other people, and they just won't make a decision. Um, it's just, it's crazy. It's sad that that's the state of affairs that we live in and that we're dealing with right now. But, uh, you know, I don't know why they won't, um, take all the medical information and everything else in hand and say, this is our decision. This is what we're going to do. Live with it. If you don't like it, get out of the FHSAA or get out of the high school organization. And then to me, if in the middle of, uh, yeah, well, at least California made a decision. I mean, I don't know if, if, if I don't, I don't know if I agree or don't agree with as bad as California is right now. And we can debate a million ways sideways about the numbers and the fatality rates and the, and the age of the people that we're dealing with. I mean, that's not really, um, um, uh, you know, per se, that's not an argument that I want to make, but just make a decision one way or the other. I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's wrong, but we're supposed to start football Monday. And this week they have this board meeting and we still don't know if we can start Monday. We don't know when games are going to be played. Schools have all, almost every school that I know of, including ours, it's been recommended to push back two weeks to at least August 24th. So, you know, if schools are, are recommended to push back to August 24th, um, then how are they going to go, um, you know, then, then how, how are we going to justify, you know, if schools can't go back to August 24th in that setting, how are we going to justify having kids in locker rooms and contacting in drills and tackling and blocking and everything else that's going on? So it's just a, it's just a complete nightmare to understand that you want to go back, but yet if you go back, how do you justify going back? Obviously for us as coaches, if the state says or whoever says that you can go back, then you do your, you know, you do your just do and say, all right, well, kids have to have all these forms filled out and they have to have all these things filled out. And if there's a COVID-19 waiver, then you go ahead and make sure that the kids have everything they want to have. But, you know, we all know that they're going to test positive And then what happens? We all know that if we, if we go back to work right now and start playing football again, you know, we all know that we're going to have positive tests. Do we just live with the positive tests and say that, hey, kids are going to get it. It's no big deal. Is there what's the quarantine period? Do we live by 14 days? If you have an offensive lineman that gets tested positive, does every kid that went in a drill one on one with him has to be tested positive? If your old lineman were in a meeting room with him, do they have to be tested positive? If you go back to football now, do you not put all your kids in meeting rooms? Do you not put starters in a meeting room with other starters? Do you break them up and figure out how to have meetings because you can't have six people lost due to a contact quarantine period? These are all the questions on top of everybody just wants to come back and play football. But these are all the questions that nobody wants to take on and nobody wants to answer. We've had for our summer workouts and the everyday human being, we've had all these quotas and standards and things to say, OK, you get a positive test. It's 14 days quarantined at home. Can't return to any activity in society until you're negative tested. Then they started talking about all the contact tracing to say that who were you in within six feet of for 10 to 15 minutes at a time, either without a mask on or whatever the deal is. There's no way in a contact sport with locker rooms and field houses and everything else that's going on. If one of my kids contacts positive during a season, does anybody on the other team have to be contact traced? Was that not enough because plays only take four to six seconds? And if there's 60 offensive plays, then that's not enough time to say that, 
a defensive player from the other team could have contacted it from an offensive player from our team. These are all the things that everybody needs to look at on top of just the medical data of, um, you know, what, when or where we can start or can't start. So, you know, the bottom line is we're, none of us are getting any answers. We're not getting, I wish I was in California and I knew that December, January was the answer. I may not agree with the answer, but at least I would be okay. I got to go to practice tomorrow and I'm still six days away and I have no idea whether to tell our kids we're practicing Monday or not. I have no idea Thursday, do I need to ha hand out helmets on Thursday? If I hand out lockers or I do lockers on Thursday, how far apart do they have to be? Do I need to be a certain space? Do I have to skip every other locker with our players? Like we have no idea whether or not we're starting. And if we're starting, nobody's even given us a direction of how to start properly. So it's just a complete shit show in my opinion. And obviously as a football coach, we want to start. Hell, I want to go back to work. I want to start coaching again. And the longer I don't coach, the longer you get to where you get out of your routine and what time you wake up in the morning and what you do and whatnot. So, I mean, I want to get back to work. I want to get back to coaching. I want to get back to a school schedule. I want to get back to a weekly schedule of playing games. I mean, heck, we all do. Um, but I'd also like to get back under some guidance to understand that I know what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. You know, it's hard enough as a football coach to follow all the rules they want you to follow now that are set in stone with physicals and dates and signatures and insurance and clearance. And we have an online athletic clearance and kids can't do anything until they're online. And it's hard enough to follow all those rules that are in stone and now come back and try and follow rules that you don't even know what they are. And they're in flux. Every time you turn around a certain rules in flux, it's, it's impossible. So, you know, for me, I just kind of want an answer. So enough of that soapbox, enough of that bullshit. Um, Good evening, Mark. Uh, two of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight were developing players and then uh, kind of some installation plans. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about developing players is I got a chance to talk every, the other day with a friend of mine, and, and uh, we had to drive about an hour to go play in a golf outing for coaches, and, and uh, we were coming from the same area, driving to a different area. So um, we had to uh, – we had to drive to this golf outing. So we just started talking about different things and we started talking about developing players and um, what's the hardest position to develop. And then um, after that, we started talking about, all right, well, would you rather develop a new player or somebody who's played before? And how hard is it to develop new players? How hard is it to develop kids that have played um, junior high or, or Pop Warner football? And he was mentioning that he's at a private school and he was mentioning that a lot of his kids don't play middle school football. So if he's lucky, maybe they played some Pop Warner football. And and I was telling him, I don't know what's what's worse, the fact that your kids haven't really played any football or the fact that some of the kids I'm getting coming from middle school or junior high football have gotten football in such a poor manner that I've got to – you know, basically the conversation came down to, is it easier to break bad habits or is it easier to paint on a blank canvas that has no knowledge of, of, you know, any previous football in general? So, you know, if you have to break habits, you have people that have a knowledge of football and they played the game. So hopefully they are aware of the physical nature of the game and they're not afraid of contact and they're not afraid to stick their nose in there, um, which is a good thing. But at the same time, they've been coached it by, you know, people that haven't had enough time under the saddle to work on the techniques and the fundamentals of playing appropriate defense and run fits and coverages and where your eyes go and what the reads are and the difference between man and zone and the difference between a reach block and a base block and a down block. And, you know, the, a lot of these guys that are coaching at the middle school level, there's two or three of them and they got to play games every Tuesday and they're scrambling to keep their neck above water to play games and get kids to line up it's hard to think of what they would actually accomplish from a technical or fundamental standpoint. So, you know, we just started kind of throwing the argument around, are you better off with kids that have played a bunch that maybe have been coached poorly that you have to now coach up or would you rather take kids that have a blank canvas? And, you know, it, I asked a question the other night on last night on Twitter, on the Sunday night Twitter chat, and it was kind of a, a 50, 50 type answer where some people, like the experience, like to know that the kid went through contact and whatnot. And then other people said, no, I'd rather take a blank canvas because I don't have to worry about getting them out of bad habits. So 
you know, regardless of where you coach in, in the country, what state you coach in, coronavirus, not coronavirus, we all have to deal with developing players. We all have to deal with it on Long Island, in Florida, in California, Texas, wherever it may be. Every one of us has to deal with developing players. So it's an interesting topic to kind of understand, um, you know, what are we – what are we trying to do when we develop players? And and for us, it's it's kind of a, a deal where it's, okay, let them pick what position they want to play first. Let us see if we can develop them in that position. If we can develop, in, develop them in that position, then let's figure out where they need the most development. Is it a athletic deal? Is it a getting in a stance? Obviously, stance and start should always be first, but is it a bending issue? Is it a mobility issue? You know, from there, is it a learning issue? Can they not understand, you know, what blocking schemes are? Do they not know what a down block is from a base block or a pull or a double team or a, you know, do they not know when we teach them who the mic or the will, or do they not know fronts or do they not know, you know, it's all of those things that you get to a point where you start to, um, you know, you kind of try to figure out how you need to develop your guys and where you need to develop them. And we know the weight room is going to be a big deal. And we know running is going to be a big deal, but I think philosophically, you know, for a lot of guys, it's kind of a, and you can even see, like in this in this live conversation right now, I can watch the number of participants go from 18 or 19 down to 13 or 12 because it's not a hot button hot button topic that a lot of people want to talk about. A lot of people don't want to talk about developing players. They don't want to talk about what's easier to develop a blank canvas or or a history of bad habits because it's not X's and O's. It's not power. It's not power read. It's not counter toss read. It's not three by one. It's not stick. You know, like today I did a a video on. Ram, you know, read away from Mike reads with a slot option on the backside. And when you're not talking about stuff like that, it's not exciting. It's not invigorating. So when you're talking about the, the brass, you know, the nuts and bolts, grassroots of football and developing players, well, hell, if you're a football coach or a head football coach, if you're not interested in developing players, then you're in the wrong business to begin with because developing players is pretty much about everything we are all about. It's about the weight room. It's about our setup in the weight room. It's about conditioning. You know, it's about techniques and fundamentals, stance and start. If you teach a kid stance and start before you ever teach them a play, it's because you're interesting in, you're interested in developing the player. So, you know, if people aren't interested in talking about developing players, it's because it's not a hot, you know, button topic that everybody wants to get in on like pressures or, or split field coverages or anything else. And that's why it kind of, um, you know, it kind of all leads back to, um, you know, people only want to hear about schemes and they only want to hear about X's and O's and everything else, but that's, that's not our job. That's not what we do. We do so many other things. So um, just thought we talk a little bit about, um, you know, developing players and what it's like. And, and, you know, we go through, and I know for me, it's a, it's a big time struggle when I get players in that have been taught very poorly from a standpoint of coverages and reads and eyes and fronts and block recognition and block destruction. And then when we start talking about all the things that we're talking about, it gets real quickly over their head. Um, And and you're trying to kind of figure out who understands the conversation and who doesn't. So we have to go back to doing half line drills and a bunch of other things. And, um, you know, but I think that's something that everybody has to understand that you're going to have to do, within your program, within your schemes, within how you're teaching things, you're going to have to go back and teach them, you know, from the bottom, the ground up and from, from, you know, feet up, so to speak, um, because uh, you have varying degrees of kids on your program with how they learn, what they know, what they don't know, who's returning. So we have kids that are returning and can play certain coverages and what we're doing is boring. But at the same time, we have kids coming that have never done that before and a pattern match or a pattern read coverage is completely over their head. And we've now lost them because we're trying to cater to them and the returner. The returner is bored to death, but the new kid can't even put one foot in front of the other. That's what we deal with as coaches. So, you know, that then leads to um, uh, Ruben, I think you got to start on a whiteboard first. The first thing you got to do is identify what your techniques are it doesn't matter what other people call them it doesn't matter you know what anybody else says um 
it's it's a matter of if whatever you say a one, a two, a three, a four, I a four, a five, a six, a seven, and eight, whatever you say those are, you've got to identify those to your players on a whiteboard. And then you've got to identify your blocking schemes based on the fronts and the plays that you're running. And then you need to go out on the field and identify those and walk through. And even if you have a day that's even only and you're only running power at the three technique. And then the next day you come back and you run power away from the technique. And then the next day you come back and you run zone at a three technique. The next day you come back, you run zone away from a three technique. However you need to do it, you need to teach it first on a whiteboard and in a classroom setting and make sure the kids know what a one or an A shade or, or a zero or a five or a four. Make sure they know what that is. Make sure the scout group knows what it is. And then once you've taught that in your schemes, now you go out, you got to get out on the field and you got to work on them and, I always like to work sometimes plays in the, in, independent of each other and say, hey, we're going to block power right now. In the next 10 minutes, we're going to block power to the three technique. And then the last 10 minutes, we're going to block power away from the three technique. Tomorrow, we're going to install zone. First 10 minutes, we're going to block it to the three. Next 10 minutes, or we're going to block it versus odd only after we develop from the even front. So that's the way I try to do it for me. Yeah, so just want to walk through it. Yeah, it's 100 uh, 130 Albert, 100%. We used to watch a ton of film at the old school I was at. The last two schools I was at, film just goes over straight over their head. They don't want anything to do with film, really don't want anything to do with chalk, chalk talks. So, so it goes to out on the field. But I still think you you, you got to introduce it on a chalkboard first, then bring it out on the field and get to it. There are certain kids that they only, they only want to do it. That's all they want to do. And it's a shame you have to cater to those kids and you have to build your program to what those kids can do and need to do. But I'm going to tell you firsthand that I think those players will suffer in the long run. They'll, they'll never be as good as they potentially could be because they don't understand the nuances of the game behind actually doing what they're doing. Is there any way I can get to read in quarters drills, Indian group work? Um, yeah, as far as the drill work, I mean, you know, basically there's no there's no reason why you couldn't do both of them in the same period and 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 break them up individually. I mean, when we're playing quarters, we're going to be asked to the sideline and we have to shuffle out crossover run. But then when we're playing quarters, it's going to be either press man or off man and we have to backpedal and our safeties have to slope in, in quarters and in two reads. So there's a lot of things for, between the, do, the two and when you're talking about reads – there's a lot of things that carry over between the two um, that I like to do within our coverages is once we get them kind of taught and understood, we do half line drills where we'll roll different coverages. Um, you know, it will, we'll roll out different coverages within the half line drill. So we'll have two receivers and a back and we'll try and change the coverages. We'll play palms one down, then we'll play man free. Then we'll play cover two, then we'll play quarters on just that half of the field. And what we try to do is if the, all those things have been taught, what we try to do is we try to roll through them in different settings so that the kids have to play one into the other, like they would in a game. Um, you know, now very early on in spring, we may have situations where we do 10 or 15 minutes of palms or 10 or 15 minutes of quarters, but in the perfect ideal world, when you already have things taught, um, you know, you have to you have to go ahead and now say, okay, now that things are taught, we've got to be able to do these things in a group setting. So a kid has to be able to play palms, one down, quarters, the next down, man free, the next down, cover two, the next down. And he's got to be able to think about all those things in a 15-minute segment. He's got to be able to play those multiple coverages it's hot while he's tired. The game. So, um, you know, those are the things that, that you've got to look at when it comes to teaching drills and teaching things. And, and you got to know what you're trying to accomplish, the footwork that you're trying to accomplish, the, you know, what, are you pedaling or are you asked to the sideline shuffling and, you know, the different reads that you got to make and the different rules within the coverages. But certainly I think you can, um, you know, I think you can start it in Indian and you bring it to group work. I don't know. Um, if you're asking me for the individual drills that I do, I really don't have anything per se, Joey, written down um, that I do. I go out there with our kids, depending on what they're good at and what they're not good at once we have the coverages in. And if we need backpedal work, I'm going to backpedal. If we need 
you know, work on shuffling, crossover, turn and run, defending the post, and we're going to do that. If we need work on declaring, you know, whether two's out, vertical or in, and we're not trading off or outs right, then we're going to do that. If my Mike linebacker needs work carrying three vertical, then we're going to do that. We're always going to do work after, again, the base foundation of what we need and how we need it. We're always going to do work based on what we need, considering the things that we're struggling with and we can't do. I've never used a call sheet on a game night calling plays. Uh, Albert, personally, um, I'm not that. That's not the way I think. That's not the way my brain goes. Um, so I can't really help you with a call sheet. The only thing I can help you with a call sheet is break them down uh, by formations or personnel groups, break them down by runs and passes, break them down by down and distance, things you want to call, you know, openers, things you want to call second and medium or second and long, things you want to call second and short, things you want to call third, medium, third, and long, third, and short, your fourth down plays, your go forward plays, your two point plays, just kind of break your game sheet up that way. everybody's still so completely confused with two and a half hours at a meeting and nobody still has an understanding of what we're and I'm trying to follow along on text and oh, this stuff is crazy and the biggest the biggest thing for me as a football coach is I just want to know when we're going so I can make a schedule. Like I haven't even been able to put out a set schedule to our players yet because if we're practicing next Monday, then the schedule is going to change and we're going to go in the afternoon. If we can't practice, but we can still work out, we're going to continue to go in the morning because it has to do with when my coaches can get on campus. So it's, it's just, you know, it's just completely so many things that they don't even take into consideration. But um, when we start talking about, you know, uh, let me just answer Mark's question. I'm sorry. I have a team of 36 players, 1935 of them are beginners and have never played football before. I have a huge problem teaching them the fundamentals because they have no previous knowledge. Yeah, that's always going to be a concern. People that have no previous knowledge, you have to teach. But the good thing about that, Mark, is you get to teach them your way and they don't get any other quote unquote bad habits so you get to teach them stance and start you get to teach them how to stand and start the way you want them to tent, stand and start and bend and flex and do all the things that you want them to do you you then get to teach them the techniques that you need within your system so if you're on offense and they're in O-line if they're in O-line excuse me and you're a gap team you get to focus on purely gap schemes and front side double teams and backside pulls and back blocks from the center and things that you know, gap schemes incorporate. And if you don't run zone schemes then you never have to teach them zone schemes so that they never learn those techniques so that they only learn one technique. So having a blank canvas and having no prior knowledge can be a good thing. It just does hurt when they have no pre private uh, previous knowledge and you're trying to teach advanced concepts like coverages and plays and RPOs and reads, but you just start from the ground up like any other kid, you know, you, you don't take, the grapes of wrath or war and peace and tell a beginning reader to read that you take them through, you know, step by step, what, you know, how you teach them to read and what their lexile level is and things that are appropriate for them to read. And then you gradually, you know, bring them up. Same thing as you do in math or any other class. Well, it's the same thing in football. You start them from base zero ground zero and you build them from there and they have no other previous knowledge. So you're only building them your way, which is the great thing. I would start stance, start every position has to get in a good stance has to know how to start whether it be the first two steps of a of a block or the first two steps of a back pedal or the first two steps of a shuffle or the first two steps of a quarterback drop or the first two steps of a receiver out of a stance that's where i would start um I mean, as far as the O-line recognizing fronts, I don't think you need the quarterback there for the O-line to recognize fronts. If if, if the quarterback is always going to delineate the fronts and, you know, tell them how to block everything, then obviously you want the O-line and the quarterbacks there. But for me, most of the time, you know, 
the quarterback looking at a front and the O-line looking at a front are for two different reasons. The O-line's got to figure out how to block that front, and the quarterback's got to figure out maybe what play he likes or doesn't like to that front or what protection he does or doesn't like. But um, I'm not sure if the quarterback necessarily has to declare the front. Um, I would be teaching my O-line separate from the QB to get extra work. And then when you get together in team, I would be piecing all those things together to say, okay, is that odd or even? What is it? And, you know, then I would be kind of building – in a team setting that way. But as far as the teaching of the fronts and things, I would teach the O-line by themselves personally. And I would be talking about that in my indie segments all the time, because when I was doing drills with my kids, I'd be teaching them as I was doing, I'd say, Hey, all right, Hey, give me, I need a guy with a hand shield. I need you in a three technique outside shade. I need you in a five technique on a tackle, or I need you in an A shade or head up. So, um, you know, I would be, I would be looking at it that way. So I would keep my quarterback and my O-line separate. Uh, I would say our defensive install um, probably three to four days if you consider, you know, starting with base, um, progressing to uh, four-man pressure with man-free, progressing to five-man and six-man pressures. A lot of our five-man and six-man pressures – are similar from a hot concept. We teach them the same way. So our three under three uh, pressures are taught just like our two under three pressures. We just have one extra dropper in. Um, trap four under two deep pressures take a little bit longer. And then man coverage has already been taught. Um, you know, you work man stuff year round. So um, I would say three to four days at most. But like any other coach, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to a point where sometime. A week or two later, I'm going to be thinking about a different movement or a next stun or something else. And But, you know, our base pressures and our base defense, I would say three to four days max for our for our stuff. And then excluding um, goal line or, or exotic stuff, whatever. But, you know, we have two or three five-man pressures that we like, and we have two or three six-man pressures that we like, and maybe one all-out seven-man pressure and – those things can get in in the first four days and our palms coverage and our mix coverage. And if we would have had spring ball and everything else is normal, I would say that it would only take us three or four days because we've already done a lot of that stuff. And we've already worked on run fits and we've already worked on our stack box run fits and we've worked on sending a fourth and playing man free. So three to four days is going to be my, my standard answer. But uh, I could see this year with, uh, I could see this year with um, with Corona and everything else going on that it may take us a little bit longer than that. We may t we may need to install uh, a little bit slower. So, sorry again. I'm not don't mean to not pay attention, but It's amazing. They just keep going round and round and round. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, how are you coaching your linebackers? What are their keys and what do you have them? Uh, Albert, we um, – we do things with our three, three stack a little bit differently than most people. We key our stack backers, key the blocks of tackles with a, uh, we start with a very small picture reading the block of the tackle and our ends and our stack backers cancel the B and the C gap based on the block of the tackle. We then kind of progress to a little bit wider view where they have to see the tackle and a flash or a pull of the guard. Um, but we keep it very, um, very, simplistic in nature because I want repetition and I want our kids to be able to do something over and over and over again without a lot of variation, without a lot of question, without a lot of gray area. So we keep it as simple as we possibly can with our backers reading blocks of offensive linemen. Our Mike linebacker reads one of the guards based on which way he sends the nose. So we read linemen first and then we progress back to the backfield because linemen don't carry the ball. So we read linemen to kind of figure out where we need to fit within our system. And then once we figure out where we need to fit, then we got to progress to ball carriers because eventually you have to tackle a ball carrier. 
Excuse me, one second. Sorry, I had to let one of my cats out. So we read linemen only. We don't we don't read back to play side guard. We don't read backs only. We, we, we don't cross key. We read linemen only first, and then we progress backwards. But that's just the way we do it because in our 3-3 stack, our, our reads and our fits are very simplistic in nature, and that's the way I want it to be, and that's the way I want to keep it. So, um, you know, that's what we choose to do. Um, what? No, I'm not listening to Macy. You need to quiet down to oh, okay. I got you. I got you. I'm trying to quiet down. Um, so, uh, you know, so so we keep it that way, and we keep it very simplistic in nature because after 22 years, I feel like that's what works for me, um, and I feel like that's the only way our kids can really fit runs consistently. So that's how we do it. So long story short, we read linemen first, progress to backs. We don't read backs first. We don't cross-key backs. We're a under under-key team is what we are. Yeah, Coach Greenfield, we probably would um, start adding some formations, which may make us, which may make us, um, you know, look at different coverages. So if we've if we start with twenty one and we got to play quarters, and then we add two removed to play palms, and then three, you know, three or trips removed, so that we can play mix or roll or whatever we're playing, we'll we'll build in formations, and then we'll start to build in motions and and um, you know things that that we need to do from there. So. Um, and then from there, it just becomes game plan. What's going to be in that week? Are we going to make any adjustments? Maybe we take our America's blitz that we really like and we change the pattern and we, you know, we, we just add an X or a cross to it and we send the mic first and the long stick second, um, you know, just little things like that based on the game plan. That's how our BOE is too. No one wants to make the first call or a defensive call. Yeah, it, it's, it's just the way life goes. People don't want to make decisions because they're worried about everybody else. That's what they're going to think about the decision. When you go over a scout team defense, I'm going to communicate to them how you want them to line up. Usually we put a coach in charge and we give them either cards or um, if it's a front. It's very hard now for us as a 3-3 stack team. Our kids aren't used to playing even front, so normally we need cards to get them lined up. But uh, if we used to play oh, like it uh, back in the day it, when I was um, – at another school and we played over and under front or bare fronts, we might be able to just tell the scout team, Hey, I need you an over to the tight end. I need you an under, I need you in bear, or I need you an odd or tiger, whatever we called it. Um, it it's a little bit different, more difficult for us now because um, we're a three, three stack team. So we don't, unless we move to over, we move to under, but we don't really line up in it. So usually we got to use scout cards and it's got to have a, it's got to have a coach in charge and, we're trying not to lose a lot of time, so those defensive players have to um, come back and get the card so that we can play at a fast pace and everything else. And so, you know, it, it's it's a lot of work, especially when you're a tempo team. Uh, we don't use our JV as a scout team a bunch. We uh, Obviously, if you're in a JV practice and your JV team has to be the scout team for your JV team, that becomes an issue. And But, they, you know, that goes along the lines of what I was saying earlier about developing players. You've got to develop players to practice too. So you got to teach players how to read cards. You got to teach players how to play scout and let them know why that's so important. You know, if you're doing special teams work, you got to teach players how to be on a scout kickoff or a scout kick return because all those things are so important. That that's part of developing players too that coaches don't understand. It's not just the physical. It's not just the blocking and tackling. It's not just the weightlifting. It's the things like hey, how to be a scout player. Hey, how to line up. Here's your scout card. You're the blue guy. You got to do this. You're the green guy. You do this, or you're you're here, or this is power with a pull. That's part of developing players, and and the better you get at that, and the better your scout team gets, then the better you become as a football program. So that that's part of it too. But as far as your JV scout team, th those looks are always going to be increasingly tough to come by, and you just got to coach them up to the best of your ability. Um, you know, and again, scout defense, it's. You try. We try not to use cards because it affects the pace of play for the offense. But when you don't play over, under, or different fronts, the kids don't know how to line up. So you have to, you know, you have to. Eventually, we get to a point where we can just try and tell them, "Hey, I need a one, one, and if you can rotate who the one and the three are. I don't care who they are, but somebody's got to be a one. Somebody's got to be a three, and I need three deep, or I need, you know, uh, our palms to read to two by two, or I need." Um, you know, three by one, I need mix or I need roll or whatever. So, um, 
you know, eventually we try to get to a point where uh, we can just call out fronts by techniques and coverages. And it's because we don't, as a tempo team, the last thing you ever want to be doing is waiting for the defense to come in and you got to show the defense this card and say, Hey guys, line up to this front and you show them the card and they all look and go, okay, I got a coach. Well, it's taken you three minutes to do that and you haven't been running any other plays. So you'd like to avoid that if possible. Um, you know, but that's part of the thing with practicing and installs and, and coaching in general is all those things, um, you know, they all are part of practicing, getting scout teams, teaching scout teams, scout cards, developing players in your scheme, teaching players how to line up to other schemes. Those are all parts of developing players in practice and becoming a head coach. You have to develop all those things. So um, it's, it's crazy. Still trying to follow this thread, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> kind of affects what I do with my kids at practice tomorrow when we show up to work and lift and do whatever. So I'm trying to figure out if there's an answer. Maintain the calendar as is with an understanding schools do not have to start July 27. Schools that wish to continue playing past the end of regular season. Up to date to be determined, they would have to notify they're not participating in this will surprise a lot of people, but it's hard to beat Mitch. Bobby John's making a motion to maintain calendar as it is. Schools don't have to start July 27th. Staff will be flexible. All right. Now I don't really understand it because now they're they're coming. They're coming back and saying that <laughs> you can start if 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 it's feasible to start on July 27th, but you don't have to start on July 27th. I'm going to put that down for a minute so we can get back to what we were talking about because that is just confusing as hell. Um, you know, so all those things, again, can go into, to, into installs and coaching and, and everything else. And, you know, the longer you do it, the more you find out that there is a systematic way to install things, and hopefully you can install them. Um, that's awesome, Rock. I hope you guys can go as, as scheduled. And um, I know a lot of those states, including Michigan, that, that, are, that I um, – that I that I have followed, a lot of them have said that they're going to start on time and said, that, but they all have an addendum to the what ifs, so that um, if if they start on time, but there's another outbreak or testing goes up again, it all seems like they're some of them want to start on time with an addendum to what to do if. So even the schools that are starting on time almost feel like something's going to occur that may throw a wrinkle into their into their system. So. Uh, for those of you rock in Michigan and everywhere else that are starting on time with no questions asked, and you can put out a schedule for your kids and let them know when practice is, um, you know, God bless you. I can't even put a schedule out right now. I don't know if we're starting next Monday. I don't know if we're starting, you know, after that, if they come back and say that the state says to start on the first day, but it's up to each individual county. Now do we have to wait on our school board to make a decision when our school board said that they were going to push school back two weeks. So if they were going to push school back two weeks, why wouldn't they push football back two weeks? So I'm, I'm just confused. I, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of, of um, questioning decisions or, or, you know, you can sit here and bash one way or the other positive, negative. I just need it. To, I, I'm a, I'm a authority person. I follow rules. I do what I'm told. Whether I agree with you or not, it's really irrelevant to me. You come down and say, this is when you start. This is what you do. Um, I do better in that situation. I, I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to like it. But if you come down from over my head and say, this is what you do and this is when you start, then that's what I do and that's when I start. When you come back and say that some schools can start here, some schools can start there, it's feasible if you can start to start. But if you're in a county that can't start, to me – in the game of football, that's just that's just Pandora's box. That's like telling guys, hey, you know, 
kids under 2.0 can play if they've been doing their homework, but another kid under 2.0, if he hasn't been doing his homework, can't play. And this kid that lives in your school zone doesn't have to play for you. He can play for another school, but this other kid that's bigger and faster can play in yours and, you know, for you from out of zone, you just, coaches aren't the type of people that you want to give flexibility to within the rules because they're going to take every rule you give them for the most part, not every coach, but most coaches are going to take every rule you give them and they're going to run with it and bend it to be as flexible as possible for their best interest. So when it comes down to um, a governing body, I think the governing body needs to come out and say, this is what you do. This is how you do it. And we will be coming around and make sure you're doing it that way. And whether you agree it or not, if you don't do it that way, there will be sanctions. There will be fines, but ours never does that. So it is what it is. Um, yeah, Steve, the state of California is done till one, one, which again, don't know whether I agree or not, but the one thing I do agree is everybody now knows that that's the start date or that's the date and you move on from there. So you can bitch about it. You can cry about it, but you know what your date is. So I kind of, I kind of appreciate that may not agree with it, but I appreciate it. Installing an offense in spring. How do you go about the installing on the O if you have a returning quarterback, new quarterback? Is that effect? Yeah, hundred percent. If we have a returning quarterback, then we may be adding things on to what we did previously that we liked. We may be adding RPOs on or adding more into the read game. If it's a returning quarterback, if it's a new quarterback, now we're just talking about base structures. Um, you know, for us this spring, it would have been interesting, even though we lost this spring, we were going from a gap scheme to a zone scheme and we were going from power duo um, buck sweep dart to inside zone, wide zone, and a little bit of counter. Um, so it was a complete philosophical change for us. So our install was going to have to be very minute in the spring and very diligent to what we wanted to accomplish in the spring because our kids had never done it. The terminology was new. The formations were new. The schemes were new. So, um, you know, this, this spring for us would have been a, even though we have some returning players, it would have been a smaller, uh, more basic install, if that makes sense, because we were doing a lot of things new, whereas last spring we rolled in and added some RPOs to the single and some RPOs to the two receiver side and some things in a read game with the quarterback and the sniffer because we were returning players and all our players were ready to go and we weren't changing systems. So we were just adding. So I think it has to do with, with where you are within your system. Are you building, adding, um, you know, what are you doing, uh, within your system compared to the year before. So I think all those things have to uh, kind of got to take all those things into consideration with what you're doing and how you're doing it. And um, definitely returning players and quarterback is a big, big part of it. Um, and how much you need to get done, what you're getting done, how different is it? Is it the same as the year before? Um Again, sorry, I don't want to be aloof from the conversation, but I'm trying to follow. So there now. Four hours in, and we still mentioned the issue that students will transfer to other schools. Feels July 27th is too soon. Um, still have no answer. Uh, so that's what we would do as far as our install is concerned on, on the offensive side. I always feel like the offensive install is a little bit more involved, except for the year we switched from four, two, five to three, three. And then that was completely different with our reads and our keys and, um, our coverages stayed the same. So I felt comfortable with that. If we were ever to switch and all of a sudden become a Ripley's match team, a single high, you know, Ripley's match team, I think that would take more install. Um, you know, if we were changing from the three, three stack to a, under front or to an even over front uh, four two five team that would take more install because now you're talking about setting fronts and setting the a shade or setting a three technique and more movement and things like that so that would probably take more install so um you know though your install is kind of dependent upon returning players knowledge of players and then your scheme what are you trying to do to your scheme are you bringing in a new scheme are you adding to your scheme are you buffing and polishing things that were already in your scheme are you working against some formations because there's a new school in your district that you might see maybe you take a week of spring to work flex bone or wing t only there, there's just so many different variable variables into uh, um how or why you would install a certain way or um what your install would look like per se. So, um, you know, I, I think, I think that's kind of 
in individualistic to your program and your coaches and your players and, and things of that nature. So hopefully, hopefully that helps you, but I can tell you right now, our install would have been really basic on offense and generic um, this spring because we were changing formations a little bit. Um, not, so, not necessarily formations. We, we were going to be two by two, three by one, but we were going to more Y off than sniffer. Um, so uh, some of the positioning was changing a little bit and then the alignments were changing and then, uh, the schemes were changing. So we would have been really generic in nature in the install this year because everything was new, if that makes sense. Our defense would have rolled right back in because we just would have tweaked some movements. Um, the only thing I was really going to tweak with the defense is when we went to four-man pressures, I was going to use the mic in all of our four-man pressures so that our stack can play all of our base coverages that we teach them. So now when we go to four-man uh, pressures, we can play all of our base coverages. The issue that I have – um, the issue that I have with that is when I send four and I slant the front, if I create a side, when you're a three, three stack team with open B gaps and you teach your kids to run fit off of open B gaps and how they fit with the end off of open B gaps. If you then slant an angle to a side that ends up with a three and a five technique, that run fit is not the same. And you have to be willing to teach a different run fit in order to play base coverages behind four man movements. So um, for us, the easiest thing for us to do would be to plug a mic in an A gap on a blitz as a fourth man movement and not have to teach any different run fits. Or when we send a fourth slant angle or blitz them in a B gap, whatever we do, when we do that, we play man free behind it because now we can teach our run fits a little bit more aggressive in a man free scheme than we have to worry about open gaps and clearing cloudy windows and things like that. So um, those are the things for us that, that kind of come into play. But we were going to slight tweak we were going to send to Mike as our fourth rusher and then figure out what we needed to do with coverages behind it and figure out how our run fits looked behind it but we felt like if we sent the mic it would make it would make it more consistent so that the two stack backers that play coverage because the mic is taught as a spy fourth add-on rusher using him as the fourth rusher in our movements made more sense that that's what we were going to do on defense and then we we're going to look at wrinkling some of our movements but um we are not a big blitz to formation team. We are a left and right defensive team. So our kids play left and right. And then based on where the ball is, we are a field blitz team, a boundary blitz team, or a middle blitz team. So based on where the ball is, we're coming with a left side blitz or a right side blitz or a middle blitz. Um, so we are not, to answer your question, Steve, we are not a formational blitz team. We are not a check with me blitz team. We are not a BTF blitz the formation team. Our blitzes are predominantly field, boundary, middle uh, per se, because it's easier for me to teach that way. And it's easier for us to get um, execution that we need. That so uh, I'm at the standpoint now in my career, I've been doing this long enough that uh, – if I can find something that's a little bit more simplistic in nature and I can be 90% effective in it um, and I can be 90% effective 100% of the time, that is better than a scheme that is a little bit more advanced or more intricate, but maybe I'm only 50% effective 100% of the time. So what I found for us with blitzing formations and check with me blitzes is um, – I could teach a couple of the kids how to do it, but I had a hard time teaching all 11. We would make the check on the field and the mic would make the check and not everybody would hear it. We would make the check and the blitz wouldn't get changed from one side to the other. Um, so I, um, I've had some success since some good times the formation and check with me blitzes and I've had some bad times with it. So I just kind of, um, gravitated away from it and went to field, field blitzes, boundary blitzes, and then kind of up the middle or up the gut blitzes for us in our three, three stack. And that's, what's, um, that's, what's worked best, best for us. We keep it, uh, very generic in nature. We blitz our linebackers 90% of the time. We do have some, um, uh, field pressures where we add, uh, a down safety as a fourth rusher off the edge. We try to quote unquote, get four from a side, uh, quote unquote, uh, to show four from a side uh, with a safety. But um, more often than not, we blitz linebackers and safeties cover, and, and we use guys to do a job that they're, we think, suited to do. And, you know, we try not to let blitzers cover and covers blitz is, is the old adage for us. So we want our blitzers blitzing and our cover guys covering. And 
we will do some things with safeties just because I think you have to throw every once in a while that wrinkle into offenses. So um, they can't pinpoint the six in the box or always the blitzers. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, you know, it, it comes down to execution as much as it comes down to messing with the other team. So, you know, blitzers, blitz, cover guys, cover runners, run catchers, catch. I mean, the throwers throw, that's kind of the philosophy of the, a lot of things that we try to, to do, although it's not, um, you know, it's not as pretty sometimes it's not as schematically diverse sometimes, but at the end of the day, for me, it's more effective when you let kids do the job that they are inherently um, built to do. So we'll send a corner every once in a while. We've done it before. You know, we've sent Cowboys from the boundary before we'll send a safety occasionally. It's not that we won't, won't do it. It's just for me, it's not something that I, live to do i know it's exotic i know it's fancy i know it catches the eye to a lot of people but uh we just it's just for us it's it's not always the greatest i like to let my guys do what they're conditioned to do best uh quarterback blitz packs is based on film how do you teach him to recognize blitz and change the call what keys do you give him for that also we don't change calls so that's the first thing i can tell you ruben so we don't we don't change calls based on blitz um we have plays built in that have multiple answers to him in the run game. Uh, if he's getting blitzes within those plays in a run game, instead of changing it to a different run, he can take the access throws or the gift throws that he needs. Um, if it's within a passing game, we have built in hot throws. We very rarely, we will check with me. Um, we will freeze and do some check with me stuff so that if I freeze and I feel like a blitz is coming from the other side, I can give him the appropriate protection, but we do not, change the quarterback is never going to change our protection he's never going to recognize blitz from another side and turn to protection um that's not what we do on offense that's not how we live and and um if i was ruben going to give you some hints for that i would tell you to talk to look at secondary play look at the rotation of the secondary most of the time if blitzes are going to come from one side there's safeties that are rotating to that side they either have to be in zone coverage or man coverage or rotate that way find a free safety if it's going to be an empty or a zero uh, a zero blitz and they're going to send six all the safeties and corners are probably somewhere in a position to play man as opposed to where they would be in zone coverage so I would talk about things like depth and leverage and where the safeties are and where the corners are when trying to figure out if I'm going to get blitzes but it's not a big part of what we do um, not so much we don't identify when we think we might be getting blitzes but we're not changing anything per se based on those blitzes so our quarterback doesn't have to make any checks or check opposite or at least for me the last couple of years. Now I have a different offensive coordinator running thing that, uh, you know, that, that, that's fine. If he wants to do that, that's just not how I do things. We're a tempo team with built in answers. And um, if we, if we have a, a pass play on and, and we're turning the protection away from the pressure and they're going to pressure, we have hot throws built in and quarterbacks got to make a hot throw and we got to live with the, with the hot throw. And that that's just the way it is. So. Sorry, still trying to follow this, and I'm getting texts. Any of the dominoes that are going to fall because of this, said Bobby Johns. Oh, God. I said private schools are not thriving during this time. It's the craziest thing in the world, guys. <laughs> I swear to another elephant in the room that begins this hurricane season. <sighs> Update the ice cream is coming out. Blah, blah, blah. Jesus. Um off the wall question, coach. How willing should I be to relocate to develop as a coach? I'm six a five a four a o line coach in Texas. Should I be willing to move to Louisiana, Florida? Uh, based on things that I know about money, I would stay in Texas. Um, unless you're young enough and you're and you're trying to 
relocate maybe to get into college football. I don't know what your what your deal is, but uh, you know the bottom line is is Texas probably pays the best for the most part and takes care of their people the best with the best facilities. And um, if you're willing to relocate as a younger guy and you want to move around and get some different opinions or some different feels of the game of football, that's fine. But um, I wouldn't leave Texas if I were you. That's just my opinion. Uh, you, you know, that that's a tough question, Rock. I think that's always going to be an interesting question to look at and say, okay, you know, what do you um, – what do you consider EDDs? Where do you throw your your backpedal time, your shuffle run time, your transition time, your baseball turns or speed turns, and then your press man coverage or your off man coverage? Is that a uh, EDD time or is that a, a a group time? Then where do you go from EDDs to group to say now I've got to physically look at the rules of coverages? I can't cover all that in EDDs. That that's an age old argument that you know that's why I for a lot rock for me i promote a lot of half line drills and half line coverage before you go to seven on seven and things like that so you can do your edd drills and work on footwork and stance and start and pedaling and transitions and tackling and things you need to work on and then when it goes to coverage time now you can teach in a half line setting where corners and safeties and other guys can be there um and then uh And then you go from there kind of to determine, um, you know, how you need to work on if If you feel like your footwork and the transitions are okay and you need to do more eyes and palms or read or match coverage, then you do more of that in EDDs. I always try to leave it up to my coaches. Um, you know, I just try to leave it up to my coaches to, to say, you know, what they're going to do or how they're going to do it within their EDDs. And with, but then I always um, – I always try and tell them, you know, I always try and tell them to do what they, to do what they do and how they do it. So we have our EDDs. We have our, and I want to do half line. I want to do seven on seven. I want to do all those things. And within your EDDs, if you feel like you need more transition time, then work on that in your 15 minutes. And then we'll get together in a group to work on more coverage. If you feel like you need more coverage time, then maybe we need to, you know, schedule more group time and maybe you only get 10 minutes of EDDs if you feel like your footwork and transitions and everything else are okay. But EDDs, the group work, the coverage, the techniques, the skills, that's going to be an argument at every position all the time. So I guess basically from a four and a half hour meeting now, they say that there is no calendar change. You start on July 27th, if, and, or, but, but again, still doesn't answer my question. We don't go back to school till August 24th. So it still doesn't really answer my question. Now the state says it's okay, but now is the County going to come back and say that we're okay to play football, even though they said that we need to push school back. Um, two weeks from its original start date. So now that school has been proposed to be pushed back, how are they going to allow us to practice football and do all those things? So I don't know. Thank you, Ruben, as always, for all your questions. Uh, Um, yeah, I wish they would make a decision and come out. Uh, apparently, they came out and made some type of decision that says uh, start July 27th, but those schools that can start, those schools that can't start, I, I don't know what it means. It's just very disappointing to be in a state that everybody looks at as, uh, you know, everybody looks at as, as a football state, but yet um, when it comes down to certain things, we really can't. Who knows? I guess I'll, I'll try and figure that shit out later. I don't know. 
I'll just go to work tomorrow and tell our kids, hey, we got practice next Monday, and I'll tell all our coaches we got practice next Monday and we're practicing at this time because it's a change for us from our normal summer and what we do and whatnot. So we'll see. Um, let's see what else we got. So we talked a little bit about development of players. We talked a little bit about install, uh, talked a lot about how crazy this time and, and, and uh, period is. I can tell you though, for most coaches that um, this is probably a big difference. Your install and your things are probably going to be affected, um, you know, by this time and what's going on and, and the time that you have or hadn't had with your players. So your install probably needs to be something of a living document. You know, maybe a lot of guys get this idea that they have this three day install and this is their offense and it stays just like this. And then you find out when football gets taken away from you or spring gets taken away or summertime gets taken away that just because that's your living document, you know, doesn't mean that it has to stay the same all the time. If it is a living document, let it breathe and let it change a little bit because it can't be the same three day install. If it's not the same as it was the year before and coaches are, are very routine oriented. I, I get and can be, I can be just as well. And um, all now, and um, you know, what we priority prioritize things going on to this important. And I personally think that it's a great thing for your offense and defense because you have to sit down and find out, look, what's really important. What is the nuts and bolts of what we do? What do we have to get up across to players? And then what are the niceties of, I'd love to be able to do this, or I'd love to be able to run that. Um, you know, I always think that that's the most important and a time like this makes us reflect on that. So for us, I know it's run. It's a hundred percent run fits block reaction block destruction. One hundred percent. If we're going to do anything well, it's going to be base defense, run fits from the three three stack, block reaction, block destruction. Then we're going to work on formations and making sure we can line up and any coverage adjustments. If we're seeing tight end tricks and we got to play more three deep to that, we'll look into things like that, and then we'll get into our movement patterns and everything else. But we are going to be in in major at our run fits in our base three to box. That's where we're starting. It's to be all end all for us. Uh, that's tough. Coach Greenfield. Um, she can do is lay out the plan and lay out what you expect to get done. You know, and it's, it's uh, one of those deals where you don't really want to put on a practice plan for, I hate to, I hate to have a practice plan and put on a practice plan every minute of every day what the coaches should be doing. I'd like to give some type of freedom to those coaches. So I may say Indy for 15 minutes, but I may not tell you what to do in Indy, you know, or, or I may say group time or whatever. And, but you know, the, the bottom line is I don't want to always be diagramming a, a, a practice plan where I have to tell them, everything that's going on at every minute of every day. That's just not what I want to do. I like to give my coaches some freedom because I, if I do that all the time, it may be best for us early on, but I don't think they learn if I always have to tell them. I want coaches who can figure out, hey, look, we got killed versus the power play. We didn't spill it. We're going to spend 15 minutes on spilling. Or, you know, we got killed in this coverage against this route combination. We're going to spend time on this route combination. I want coaches to know – what we struggle with, what we did poorly and, and, you know, and, and how we need to fix it from there. Uh, yeah, you get the team and something hasn't been taught and then you have something on a script and it's like, oh shit, I didn't get to rain or lightning or I didn't get to, um, you know, I didn't get to rock or loco or sorry, coach, I didn't get to quarters and I know quarters is on the team schedule and, um, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. It's stupid. Um, 
but you got to do it. And if you got to do it and it's best for your defense, then you do it. I, I just don't like doing it. Uh, very comfortable experience with wide mid. Uh, that's going it feels that outside zone should be a perimeter play. How do I encourage mid wide zone while being respectful? Um, first of all, ask him if or respectfully ask him if he thinks there's a difference between outside zone and wide zone. Zone, um, you know, one way or the other. Uh, if you, you know, if he understands the differences, and then you can then. Speak about your preference on why you like wide zone more over outside zone. You guys might not even agree on what the differences are. So that's the first part I would start with. I would, um, I would say that, uh, I would say that, that you need to, uh, start with what he thinks outside zone is and what you think outside zone and wide zone is and see if you're on the same page and then go from there, uh, to figure out, um, if, if it's a perimeter play or if it's a wide zone play where it's got the chance to cut back or if he thinks it has to be circle the wagons fully reached, um, start there before you, you know, start there before you actually figure out um, if you're arguing about the same thing or not. So. Any other questions you guys got tonight? We've been on about an hour and eight minutes, and I'm still trying to figure out what the hell's going on with us. Apparently, we start next Monday, but um, I'm still trying to figure out what's going on and how it's going on. So, essentially, boils down to a willingness to cut inside a three technique. Uh, yes and no, uh, Robert. Um, it basically boils down to a willingness to take somebody that you can't reach and run them and then cut behind, you know, so obviously if it's a three and a five and you can't reach the five, if you can't reach the three or the five, then the ball is going to go behind the three. But if you can't reach the five, but you get the three reached, then the ball is going to go in between the three and a five. So to me, it comes down to more or less, um, you know, the willingness to say that if a guy can't get reached, I can run him and the ball doesn't have to circle away. So, you know, that's just my perspective on it, on, on what I think wide zone and outside zone are different. And, you know, if he says wide zone is a perimeter play and, and um, if he says wide zone is a perimeter play and, and it has to get to the perimeter and you're teaching it as a play that is going to involve a hook at hand and guys not crossing your face. And after three steps, if you can't reach it, you're going to run them, you know, then it's going to be a little bit different issue uh, as far as, there's a wide zone and his outside zone version are. So biggest thing I can tell you is, is talk about it first before you start arguing about it and figure out if you're on the same page, then you can argue about it and say why you like wide zone, mid zone or anything else. Um, So hopefully that makes sense to you. But again, Robert, you're going to lose based on the amount of votes that you have. You're going to lose that argument either way because he's the head coach and you're an assistant. So, um, or your OC, either way, if you're an assistant, your OC has got one more vote than you and your head coach has way more votes than you do. So unfortunately, as an assistant, you'll lose those votes to them. You just try to do the best you can. Um, try to do the best you can as far as getting your argument across and what you think. Huh? What happened? Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, hey, buddy. Thank you. So, um, you know, so it's just one of those things where don't be belligerent, but get your point across. Let them know why you think wide zone is different than outside zone. Let them know why you think you need to have wide zone as opposed to outside zone. And at the end of the day, if they don't want it, then you just don't do it. So, um, you just need to go about it that way to the, to the best of your ability.
Yes. Yes. 100%. If you DM me something on a video or something else and you want me to look at it, I will always look at it and get back to you. Uh, hey, coach, what's a good defense run if you have fast and more athletic players? Uh, I would always go odd if you're if you're a little bit faster. Um, not to say that you can't be an even. But, um, if you have more back end players, then if you go, you know, if you go three four stuff, you only have to find three D linemen, and now you've got four linebackers, four secondary players, eight back end players. Um, but obviously, way back in the day, Jimmy Johnson. Uh, with his teams at Miami and in the Cowboys and, and Florida state back in the day, they would have four, three teams that were built on speed. So I'm not saying you can't be an even front team built on speed, but if you had speed more so than big players, I would look at being an odd team or a three, four team. Um, yes, Jack, we're still doing conditioning right now. And I think we just, uh, thank you, Tigris. Um, we just, uh, I think based on what I've been trying to follow and read, um, based on what I'm trying to follow and read, uh, I think, um, we're going to play football, uh, starting, we're going to practice next July 27th, uh, next Monday. I believe we're going to start practice, uh, from everything that I understand, unless our County or somebody else says different. So, um, we just started in the weight room last week. We've been in the weight room for um, two days, and we've been running for the last three or four weeks. So uh, we've been back for a little while, and now we'll see what happens with the rest of this. Uh, I just tried to do it, but it doesn't give me the DM option. You must have your settings on where you have to follow the person. All right, so did you just – where are you, buddy? What's your What's your Twitter, Joseph? If you're following, hopefully you're following Sting8740. That's the easiest – or Coach Mac 8740 sorry. So if you follow Coach Mac eight seven four zero, I will follow you back, and then you can DM me at the real JC forty eight. Okay, at the real. All right, so you're saying you just followed me? You followed Coach Mac eight seven four zero. That's not you. At International IC, at Coach Marlowe. You're you're sure. Good night, Coach Greenfield. You sure you followed Coach Mac eight seven four zero. 
I'm going to go the real JC48. Are you in Texas, JC? Okay. I'll follow you because it says your tweets are protected. Only confirmed followers have access to. So I'm going to follow you and it's going to make it pending. And now you're going to have to follow me back. And then you could probably send me a DM. I think your stuff is a lot more protected than mine is. Yeah, as soon as you confirm the follow, you should be able to send a DM. Uh, uh, you know, an O-line coach, you want somebody that's energetic. You want somebody that's enthusiastic. You want somebody that is uh, going to be tough on technique and fundamental and be very demanding. You want somebody that's going to put a lot of time and effort in. You want somebody that wants to go the extra distance with those kids because they're not skilled players. They don't get the ball. They're not divas. They just, um, you know, they just want to be coached. They want to be respected. So, um, you know, just a lot of character traits that I would want. It's not that much different than any other position, but I just think the only thing with O-line is you got to go that extra mile because they don't get the ball. They're not divas. They don't get celebrated. So you really got to love them, have somebody to love them. So I wouldn't say it's much different from us, from my other coaches, but, uh, you know, O-line development is very important to your program and you got to find the right kids and they got to be kids that are uh, very unselfish because they're never going to get the football and, you know, they're not divas, but you got to instill those characteristics in them, to, you know, to, to get them to do the things that they need to do to build the team because they're never going to see their name very often in the paper. And so your O-line guy is always going to be one of the most important guys on the staff. So, all right, guys, we're pushing about an hour and 20 minutes now, and I'm now getting texts from uh, my AD and some other people trying to figure out what the heck we're going to do next week. So um, I appreciate you guys being on tonight. I appreciate all the questions. Again, if you guys ever have anything that you want to talk about on this live session, when I set up YouTube Live, it asked me to put a title. So I just put a title about things we might talk about. But if you ever want anything that you want to talk about individually, just send it to me in a video on, on the comment on a YouTube video or in a text or uh, a DM on Twitter, and we'll set up the YouTube live to talk about it that way. But um, as always, guys, I appreciate everything you guys do. If you haven't checked out the Patreon site, uh, Patreon site has video clips of us playing things. We actually, I actually go through talking through, um, you know, us playing the things that we're playing, which I never do on YouTube. It's just whiteboard stuff. And then I have some webinars on the Patreon site and some clips from the play fast clinic speakers, about 10 or 15 minute clips from 10 different speakers. So uh, if you haven't checked out the Patreon site, patreon.com backslash coach Mac, make sure you check that out again. Appreciate everything you guys do. I'll see you sometime next week. Peace.